Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, the number of people being newly diagnosed with HIV and AIDS falls to its lowest level in decades. A look at why and where disparities still exist. What went into making tennis icon Serena Williams, well, an icon? The host of WBEZ's Making Podcast joins us with a look at the new season. A preview of the 28th annual Black Harvest Film Festival, which kicks off this week at the Gene Siskel Film Center. Far South Side residents are getting a new park expected to bring both economic and community development. And speaking of parks, Chicago's oldest African-American camera club focuses on the history and natural beauty of Washington Park. All that coming up, but our first story tonight, new diagnoses of HIV drop in Chicago. What's behind it right after this? Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. The number of people being newly diagnosed with HIV and AIDS has fallen to its lowest level in decades. A new report from the Chicago Department of Public Health says not only are fewer people being diagnosed in the city, but more people who are already living with HIV AIDS are reaching viral suppression, improving quality of life, and making it tougher to spread the virus. Here to talk about this are Dr. Maya Green, Chief Medical Officer for Howard Brown Health, and Jerome Montgomery, executive producer at Project Vita. Welcome back. Thanks to you both for joining us. Now, Dr. Green, let's start with you, please. To what do you attribute this decline? Well, you know, it's attributed to multiple things, right? Um, some say it's attributed to the shutdown and low access to care. But historically, remember, we were saying, hey, you equals you. What we know is the viral low suppression rate across Chicago increased 11% to 61%. What does that mean? Um, undetectable means untransmissible. So those people are no longer uh, transmitting the virus to other people. The other thing, so that means I'm getting in care, I'm taking my medicines, and zero times in history has someone living with HIV given the virus to anyone when the viral load is suppressed with now easier to take med medicines. The second thing is, they're status neutral interventions, meaning if I'm living with HIV, I have increased access. If I can benefit from PrEP medicines to protect my body against HIV, should I come in contact with it, I also had an increase in access. So they're handling it on the both end, on both ends and it's showing. So I'm excited about that. Uh, now, specifically, CDPH says that 627 new HIV diagnoses were reported in 2020 in Chicago. That is the lowest number since 1987. And 269 people were diagnosed uh, with the most advanced stage of HIV infection. That is, of course, AIDS. Um, the lowest new diagnoses since 1985. But though there are still disparities, uh, half of new HIV diagnoses occurred in black Chicagoans. Jerome Montgomery, to what do we attribute that disparity? Well, as we've seen by our most recent pandemic, you know, there are definitely inequities when it comes to access to care and services. You know, um, as the numbers state, there has been a significant decrease in the overall infection rate of HIV. However, during that same time frame in 2020, the black population made less than 30% of the city's population, yet they were over 40, 45% of the new diagnosed cases which is definitely showing an extreme disparity when we start looking at that. Access to um, equitable health care, access to equitable education, career opportunities, mm -hmm. as well as an inequitable distribution of funding amongst organizations within community, um, particularly those community-based organizations who provide a significant amount of support um, in helping to reach those hard-to-reach populations and providing culturally competent care. Um, stigma is a huge factor 
and continuing, particularly when you start looking at some of the nuances that are experienced within black or brown culture. So those things are continue to attribute to the lack of individuals wanting to gain access to care or feeling that they could um, come to come to come to terms with their diagnosis or even their sexual orientation or gender identity. And, and, and CDPH, it towns, uh, and you mentioned, you know, the, the community-based organization, CDPH is touting its population-centered health homes, PCHH, as contributors to these lower rates. Uh, Jerome, tell us a little bit about how these work, please. Absolutely. So um, the patient-centered health homes are created to kind of be a, a one-stop shop, whether it's um, uniquely or independently or through other relationships. So the belief is that individuals who get an integrated form of care can be treated holistically, and therefore it's not just about their um, physical diagnosis, but also it looks internally and treats the individual holistically. Um, so this particular approach, again, through whether independently or through collaborations will help get an individual connected, not only to medical services that they may need, but also other essential supportive services, such as housing, such as employment, such as mental health, as well as other, other factors that contribute to um, the inequities or the, 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 the social determinants uh, to health. So revisiting something that you mentioned earlier, Dr. Green, the report also shows an 11% increase in people who've achieved viral suppression from 2019 to 2020. Uh, but of course, the racial disparities still exist there with 55% of black Chicagoans with HIV AIDS achieving viral suppression compared to 71% of white Chicagoans uh, living with HIV AIDS achieving viral suppression. Uh, we asked CDPH Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwoody about this just last week. Here she is. If people consistently take their medications for HIV, HIV becomes almost impossible to spread. And so, uh, whereas you know across the whole country, only, only a little more than half of people living with HIV are consistently taking their meds and what's called virally suppressed, people attached to our health homes in Chicago, more than 90% of them are virally suppressed. And when someone is virally suppressed, they're not going to get significantly sick, but more importantly, they're unable to spread HIV. And of course, that medication that, uh, that Dr. Arwady is referring to there is PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, we also you know, heard about this disparity, though. What can be done to bridge that? Well, you know, this disparity we, has existed since before I was born, before we all were born, right? And so the disparity is in the root of the problem. So what I mean is we can put HIV here, I can put hep C here, diabetes, high blood pressure, look at what's happening with the opioid overdoses and things like that. I pick hep C because there's a cure. If this is a tree, I can cut this branch off. And what does that tree do? It grows another branch because the problem was never the branches, the problem is the root. And that's inequities and social determinants of health going back to what Jerome was saying. If we can't operate and treat the whole patient through a population-centered health home model, that means I'm making sure food, no one is concerned about their pill if they're hungry if they can't make a living for themselves. If you go back to a hierarchy, or a hierarchy of needs, those things have to be satisfied before the patient even in, wants to engage in any conversation. The other benefit of having a population-centered health home is most of them are right in the community. So I'm in the community when it's back to school time. I'm in the community when it's going to worship time. I'm so in the community, not when I'm just treating a virus. So a problem that that uh, obviously it sounds like you have to take a holistic approach to in order to solve uh, something that we can't solve fully, obviously, in this segment. Yeah. We'll have to leave it there. Dr. Maya Green and Jerome Montgomery, oh. thanks to you both for joining us. All right. Thank, thank you for having us. Have a good one. And we're back with more Chicago Tonight Black Voices right after this. On November 4th, the annual Black Harvest Film Festival kicks off its 28th year of celebrating black filmmaking and stories through screenings and special events. The organizers have dedicated this year's event to the memory of the festival's co-founder, Sergio Mims, who died earlier this month. This is the 28th year uh, that we're celebrating the Black Harvest Film Festival uh, with the Gene Siskel Film Center. So they've been amazing at building and cultivating this community of creators, uh, largest black film festival in the Midwest. And what Sergio built 
several years ago as a co-founder, especially as a black man in this industry. He's created a a, a legacy and built a platform that we feel honored to continue to build on. This year's festival is a month-long showcase of black stories featuring over 50 films, uh, 20 feature films, 25 short films, about 15 separate in-person and virtual filmmaker appearances and conversations, cast appearances. We've got some anniversary screenings that we're going to be showcasing as well. So we're really excited about the film Inspection by Elegance Braddon. That project has done very well at multiple festivals. Uh, the story of uh, a Black gay man into the military and his journey, his experience. He'll actually be with us at the festival uh, uh, showcasing his not only his project, but telling his story. So we're excited uh, for that creator to be present. And you'll find more information on the schedule of events on our website. Past seasons of WBEZ's biographic podcast called Making dove into the rise of three people so iconic, you know them by just one name, Oprah, Beyonce, Obama. You're still going to get the one name only level of legend in this latest season, but they've shaken things up a bit. Now each episode covers a different figure each week. And the show has a new host, Brandon Pope, who joins us now to talk about it. Brandon, welcome in. It is good to have you on Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, finally. Good to be here as always, yeah. So this is your first season, though, as the show's host. Yeah. First, explain the concept for folks who might not be familiar with it. Yeah, the idea is just, you know, what made these iconic black figures who they are? It's a, it's a great question, and it's one that I think is really fascinating. So what we do is it's, it's a biographical podcast. Each week you're going to hear the making story. How was Serena Williams made? How was Reverend Jesse Jackson made? How was Rihanna, the pop superstar, made? Who just dropped From, a new song. Who just dropped a new song, which is forever. pretty good, pretty mm -hmm. good, right? Yeah. And the key thing is you're hearing from people that knew them in those pivotal years and helped them get to where they are. They got the best perspective on it, and you hear it from them right there in the podcast. So we have a clip of record producer Evan Rogers, who discovered Rihanna in Barbados in 2003. He's talking about the release of the song Umbrella and how it changed everything for her career. Here that is. I think we always felt from day one that she had a, a richer, lower part of her tone that really allowed her to shine. And Umbrella, everything came together. It was the comfort zone where she could show that swag in her voice. Uh, everything began to change quickly when that song hit. Brandon, how do you decide which years are the, the making years? Ooh, that's the tough one, Brandon, especially for people like like a Rihanna, who have a, a career that's still happening, right? They're, they're still very much in the public eye. I think the key thing for us as we think about, okay, what are the areas people don't know about the most? What are the things that might be the biggest question marks? And for a lot of people, they know Rihanna's from Barbados. They don't know exactly how she made that Barbados leap to the United States and sleeping in the offices of Jay-Z and, you know, people holding her ransom saying, we have to sign <laughs> her today, you know? So those are, the, those are the key stories right there. And then we decide, we literally ask the question in the group as we're deciding, okay, is she made at this point? Has she made it? And then we cut it off. Uh, so for people who are maybe Serena Williams fans, maybe mm. they're not necessarily tennis fans, yeah. uh, one of the guests is tennis pro Chanda Rubin. Uh, it, so she gave a little bit of insight on Serena's service game, and here's a little bit of that. Because she could hit to every single spot in the service box. She could hit out wide. She could hit up the tee. She could go into the body. Those are kind of the primary three. But she could do it with the same look, with the same toss, so you couldn't read it. And so it was, it was the sum total of her game and what she brought to the court. So even if you were a good returner like I was, how do you how do you make inroads into that kind of service game? How do you decide who to talk to uh, on that episode, particularly for Serena? Yeah, for Serena Williams, it was tough because it's like, who is going to give us the best perspective? And you want it to be from different angles, right? Uh, so for this episode in particular, we had Chanda Rubin, excellent, played against her, can talk about how scary it is to play against someone like Serena Williams and how that has to, how you have to, you have to up your game to play against her. Then we think, okay, how about family life? The, the family story is a big part of her legacy. We talked to her older sister, Isha Price. And then finally, uh, you want to get the coaching perspective, a person who actually sat there with Serena, taught her what, some, some things that she knows, and that's Rick Macy, who if you saw the movie King Richard, uh, John Bernthal plays the guy that moved the family literally from Compton, California, out to Florida because he's like, 
this girl is just so good. So getting those people together, they all got a different perspective. They all bring something different to the table. And a lot of these figures, that's the thing, they're multi-layered. Yes, Serena Williams is a tennis star, but she's also a fashion icon as well. Think about the swag she brings to the sport. She is a, a heroine to so many. Same for Rihanna, much more than music, obviously. We've been begging her to release music. She's a fashion <laughs> mogul as well, right? So you want people to be able to talk about all of those different angles to people, not just one of them. Uh, your latest episode is on Reverend Jesse Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, how do you approach uh, figures differently, you know, political figures mm -hmm. like Jesse Jackson compared to um, some of the entertainment figures, even historical figures? Yeah, I, I think the key is telling a complete story. Obviously, a thing like Rihanna is a little more um, lighthearted, right? Whereas Reverend Jesse Jackson, there are elements to his story, like the assassin assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, that you want to treat with, you know, the, the right respect, the right heft. Um, and the th thing about the Jesse Jackson episode, too, um, is we talked to an, uh, a biographer of Jesse Jackson who's really objective. And she got a lot of hate and, and death threats because of the way she documented the Jesse Jackson early life and the way the MLK assassination went down and the aftermath of that. There's some conflicting accounts there, mm -hmm. and we're able to dive into that um, and be really objective and unbiased in, in the way we do it. I think that's really the important part. Something that I've noticed about, about most of the folks that we've been talking about, you mm -hmm. know, Rihanna, uh, Serena Williams, Reverend Jesse, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, each of them is still, you know, relevant. Like, we're talking about, like, yeah. the making of them, obviously, but, um, you know, I think this uh, was released some weeks, you know, after she announced that she was evolving away from tennis. And, of course, Rihanna has announced that she is uh, headlining the Super Bowl mm -hmm. in addition to dropping this new album. So it seems like each of these folks is still... Um, it's still relevant. We're, we're still talking about what they're, the work that they're doing. Absolutely. I mean, that's the coolest part, right? If we didn't want it to be the History Channel, right, where you're talking about a bunch of people who there's not a lot of connecting to. There will be some episodes where we do talk about Frederick Douglass and some really cool people who did some great things. But to be able to have people that are currently, their story is not completely written yet. They're still writing it. I think that makes it even more fun because it gives us the opportunity to also maybe go back later on and revisit it and see what the next chapter is. Maybe a making part two. Ooh, that sounds Ooh, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as a journalist, Brandon, you're pretty plugged in. Is there anything that you learned, anything that you were surprised by? Mm, that's always a great that's question. That's a good question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Uh, the, the Rihanna episode to me... I learned the most. It was the most enlightening uh, because I, I have always been a fan of Rihanna, but I didn't realize the effort she put in, the work ethic. And it's such, a, such an unconventional story. Evan Rogers, who you heard from, this white guy producer, he goes to Barbados, he goes to a talent show, he hears a young girl sing, and he says, you know what, I'm going to bring you to the United States with me. How her parents agreed to that, how she reacted to all that. I mean, that's just, that just doesn't happen, right? And then to have that talent be developed, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. They worked years to get her her first Ponda Replay single. Um, and just that progression and that effort, that drive, I think that's really inspiring. And so learning those details, it, I leave each conversation inspired, thinking, wow, if they can do that, we have a very, some, a lot of these people have very similar stories, I find, too. Um, if they can have that struggle, those those you know objects in their path you know hey we can do the same thing we can get we can get past those things as well and hey we got making ourselves right yeah, yeah. And, and some of those things they sound like the fairy tale but yeah. in the making podcast you hear like there's a process none of it none of it happened overnight. nothing's happening overnight no all right brandon pope good to see you thanks for joining us thank you so much up next a preview of this year's black harvest film festival stay with us The Roseland community is getting a public park for the first time in 50 years, thanks in part to a grant from the Chicago Recovery Plan. Community partners and the design team worked with the Sheldon Heights Church of Christ, which owns the space to convert a vacant lot on South Halstead into Pop Heights Park. This park is just at one entity of a larger plan that Far South Community Development Corporation has to really focus on making sure that this community continues to thrive and grow through our Bringing Communities Back initiative is really designed 
to address a lot of the vacancies that we have here in the Roseland community. Parks play a significant role in community development and economic development. There is data that shows that the more parks and tree can higher tree canopy coverage that a neighborhood has, the higher property values the houses in the neighborhoods have. So this park really adds to another layer to Far South CDC's initiative to elevate the value um, of, and quality of life of residents in the area. And Pop Heights Park at 112th and Halstead is one of 12 new public spaces funded through the city's Public Outdoor Plaza program. See, Pop? It includes a stage, a roller skating ribbon, half basketball court, and community garden, among other developments created to ensure the park is welcoming to all ages, especially residents in Roseland, Morgan Park, and West Pullman. It officially opened this afternoon. And speaking of parks and the impact they can have on residents, this next story is about a group of photographers focusing their cameras on people and the landscaped beauty of Southside Parks. Now they are combining their passion for pictures with early Chicago history. The Washington Park Camera Club was organized in 1955. It is the oldest African-American camera club in the city. We met them earlier this year to find out about their present day dive into the city's past. Here's Mark Vitale with the story. I grew up here. I moved in in 59, so I was four years old. And for us, when your parents say you can go outside and play, that meant that we could go to the park. You know, it was only a block away. So this was my, my backyard. You know, why, why play in the alley when you can come out here and play on the grass? Yeah, I shot crime scenes for about 10 years with the uh, police department. But now it's more of a joy. You know, you can sit back and take whatever it is you want to take. We spoke with a few of the 40-plus members of the Washington Park Camera Club in the 345-acre park that gives the club its name. Their latest project blends past and present. They are pairing old views of the park with new inspirations. It's a tribute to the park's creator, 19th-century landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted, who completed the park in 1871. We found out that this was a, a celebration for Olmsted's 200th birthday. And for this magnificent space, and it's still here, it's still pretty much the same way that he left it, you know, very small changes. And what I love about it is that he gave the community the space. In order for you to appreciate the park, you have to get into the uh, a belly of it. There's hidden spaces, and that's what Olmsted was known for. You'll walk through a path. Then all of a sudden the path is going to open up to a lagoon, um, it might be a little creek, green spaces. Olmsted was an artist, a conservationist, and an early abolitionist. This photographic salute to Olmsted is sponsored by the Hyde Park Historical Society and the Chicago-based Terra Foundation for American Art. The project has an enthusiastic supporter and a local historian. Frederick Law Olmsted was really a remarkable uh, human being. He is considered the founder of American landscape architecture, and he had the idea that American parks would be kind of the, the, this like tremendous democratic experiment. During Victorian society, there were few places where people of all backgrounds and classes could actually ever even mingle or meet or you know see each other. But parks were these spaces. They they were the parks that belonged to all the people. The Washington Park Camera Club is made up of both beginners and professionals. It is, as they put it, where great minds click. We form our own community. You shoot your natural instincts. So I'll, I'll say it this way. No matter what my assignment is, if a child walks by or, or, or a, a family with their children, I will stop and take that picture because that's, that's something that means a lot to me, to see black families out enjoying the, the community, see children. When I come out, I'm talking to people, and they're sharing their um, experiences in the park. So I'm, I'm shooting them, and then the landscapes. When you come in a park, you take a lot of this for granted. But this whole thing was actually a gift from Olmsted. He thought about this 150 years ago. The Chicago Park System is just an amazing resource for the city. Not only just the most incredible places to go, but they are essentially living works of art. Things haven't changed, you know. These are the same locations. Some of these trees are older than the park itself. We took advantage of all of this out here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Olmstead. <laughs> For Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, this is Mark Vitale.
Landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted also designed Central Park in New York and the grounds of the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. You can visit our website for details on a virtual exhibit by the Washington Park Camera Club. And that's our show for this weekend. Please be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com news for the very latest from WTTW News. And if you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Black Voices and Latino Voices on Sundays beginning at 10 p.m. And join me and Paris Shuts next week at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.